Okay, well, my name is Sean Canning. I'm the principal architect at 1070 Architecture. We're a San Diego-based architecture studio specializing in modern and minimalist designs. And I'm gonna get started right here with this presentation. So I went to school in New Jersey at NJIT where I met my wife, Margaret, and we moved out here a little over 10 years ago. And for the last decade, we've been running this business, 1070 Architecture. We've come to specialize in permitting in the city of San Diego, and we work on a lot of custom homes north of Route 8, and we also work on a lot of small ADUs all over, but generally south of Route 8. We've come to become the um, leading architecture firm in the new ADU re regulations because we've been building our own ADUs. And as part of that, we've gone through a process with the building department where we've really looked at every single nuance and tried to get a full explanation of where that code comes from and how it can be applied. This is actually a image of our own ADU, which is currently in construction. So not only are we a firm who designs and permits accessory dwelling units, but we design, permit, and build our own accessory dwelling units, which really um, comes with a whole lot of new perspective. This presentation is called The Truth About Accessory Dwelling Units, What They Won't Tell You at the Development Services Department. And it's titled like this because we found through going through this process with multiple projects and different clients that there's lots of nuance in this accessory dwelling unit regulation and there's all these hidden fees that you really should be aware about before you start this process. So I'm gonna cover four things here. First, we're gonna talk about which properties qualify for ADUs and JADUs. JADUs are junior accessory dwelling units, and we'll talk about these more as we go through this presentation. The second thing I wanna cover is the differences or benefits between dwelling units and the various ADU typologies. Third, I wanna look at some general ADU regulations and codes. And fourth, I want to try to share some loopholes and cost-saving tips for accessory dwelling units that we've discovered. So, of course, the purpose of these accessory dwelling units is to relieve the housing crisis we have here in San Diego. Every year, we fall short of meeting the housing goals by 12,000 units, and this has gone on for the last decade. So it just continues to get amplified and amplified, and ultimately what you create is a very expensive housing market, a spot where it's very difficult to get a rental unit, and it even dovetails into the homeless crisis. So in January of 2020, the state of California created their own accessory dwelling unit regulations, and they forced all the municipalities to follow these regulations. It took San Diego 11 months before they put out their first issue of the municipal code, which adapted these regulations into their municipal code. And we were using the state regulations far before the city incorporated them into their municipal code. So that's where a lot of this information comes from. We really had to have a lot of conversations with the building department about what was gonna be allowed and what was gonna be permitted. And we did all of this before they even had it in their municipal code. And just as a general contingency, the accessory dwelling unit codes are a moving target. They update the municipal code every two or three months, if not every, every month. And as part of that, they're always changing these things. So in general, what I'm gonna tell you here is probably gonna remain consistent for the next couple of years, but it's always subject to change. So first off, which properties qualify for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. Well, I'm gonna take a community here, the El Cerrito community of San Diego, and I'm gonna use this as an example. You can follow these steps with any community in San Diego and basically go through the same process and determine what you can build in your community and on your lot specifically. So the way zoning works in San Diego is the zones are already applied to the different lots. And generally you have your commercial zones set up along your main streets, and then you have your multi-unit zones closer to those or closer to the denser areas of, of downtown or the beach communities. 
And then after that, you have your single family zones, which are kind of the least efficient use of space, but sometimes it's some of the more desirable areas to live. So what you're looking at in this El Cerrito community here is three basic zonings. So the first one is the CUPD. This is the Central Urbanized Plan District. So this is a commercial zone, which is sort of structured right next to that main street down the center of the community. So this is where you're gonna see all of your commercial developments pop up and possibly some mixed use developments. Mixed use is when there's commercial and residential on the same lot or in the same building. The next zone that's important to understand is the residential multiple unit zone. And this is sort of the tan area on the bottom left of the El Cerrito uh, community. Now these areas are where we can build multiple units. And then finally in yellow, we have the residential single unit zone. In this case, it's an RS17 zone, which is a very, very common residential single unit zone, which you'll find across San Diego. And all of these would qualify for ADUs, just in different types of capacity. So that's what I wanna really be clear on right now. So just to break it down again, we have these three zones, the RS zone, the RM zone, and this commercial zone. Commercial zone will vary depending on different neighborhoods. So in the RS zone, this is the residential single unit zone. You probably have an RS zone if you're looking at this pre presentation. It's probably an RS zone or RM zone, and it's more likely that it's an RS zone. In the RS zone, you can build a dwelling unit proper, which is like a basically a home, which you may or may not already have on your lot. But you can also build an accessory dwelling unit, a junior accessory dwelling unit, and a guest quarters. Now, in comparison with the RM zone, the residential multi-unit zone, we can build the dwelling unit, but in this case, we can probably build dwelling units, as in plural. We can also build the accessory dwelling unit and the guest quarters, but we cannot build the junior accessory dwelling unit in the RM zone. And then finally, in this commercial zone, we can use we can build ADUs in this commercial zone. However, you have to first have a mixed use development or at least some sort of residential unit existing before the city will allow you to build ADUs on a commercial zone lot. So we're not gonna cover commercial zoning that much because it gets very technical. We're gonna stick to the RS and RM zones for the purpose of this presentation. So what is the difference or the benefit between dwelling units and various ADU types? So I've created this spreadsheet right here and across the top, you're gonna see the four different typologies we just discussed. Your dwelling unit, your accessory dwelling unit, then your junior accessory dwelling unit, and finally your guest quarters. And on the left, we're gonna go down a couple different categories and compare and contrast all four of these typologies to see which one is the best for your lot. Okay, so the first one is rental. So this question comes up quite a bit. Can I rent this accessory dwelling unit? And the answer to that question is yes, you can. ADUs and JADUs are available for long-term rent only. This means 30 days or more. So this could disqualify you from using that as an Airbnb or a VRBO, where rental terms are generally short-term under 30 days. The dwelling unit, you can rent for both short-term and long-term, but the ADU and the JAU are long-term only. The guest quarters is not legally allowed to be rented. Okay, next in terms of size. So the dwelling unit is gonna be limited to your floor area ratio, and this is based on your base zone. So if you have an RS17 zone, it's gonna have an assigned floor area ratio. And I just wanna explain what FAR is, or floor area ratio. So if you have a 7,000 square foot lot, and you have an FAR of one, this means you can build 7,000 square feet across that lot. And you can do this in any way, respective of the setbacks and the height restriction. So for example, on a 7,000 square foot lot with an FAR of one, I might end up building two floors, which are 3,500 square foot each. And that would put us right at our maximum floor area ratio. So as I mentioned, the dwelling unit is limited by the 
base zone FAR. However, the accessory dwelling units are limited in terms of size. So we can build one as small as 150 square feet, but we could also build one as large as 1,200 square feet. And for context, a 1,200 square foot ADU will get you a three or four or maybe even five bedroom home. So it's a fairly large home. And in most cases, you'll be able to meet whatever housing need you have with an ADU. Now the JADUs, they're designed to be slightly smaller than the ADUs and they range from 150 square feet to a maximum of 500 square feet. So the JADU does have to be considerably smaller in most cases. And finally, we have the guest quarters and the guest quarters are allowed to have a total size of 25% of the allowable gross floor area. Now this is where it gets really interesting. The next, the next row we're gonna explore here are the setbacks. So for a dwelling unit, dwelling unit, we're gonna have a front yard, a street side yard, an interior side yard, and a rear yard, which is all based by the zone, by the base zone that we looked at earlier. Now the street side yard only comes into play if you have a corner lot where you have a front yard and a street side yard. But if, you're, if you do not live on a corner or if the lot you're looking at is not on the corner, you're not gonna have a street side yard. But this is where it gets really interesting because the ADUs and the JADUs do not have to have an interior side yard or a rear yard setback. So in theory, this means we can build our ADU or our JADU all the way up against our side yard or our rear yard. Now in practice, it's best to leave a little bit of space so you can install a drain or so you can have some room to work and construct this, this wall on your property line, um, unless you're on great terms with your neighbor and they're willing to lend you about three feet of their property for the period of construction. But this is a major advantage for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. Guest quarters are gonna have the same regulations as dwelling units. Next up is the height limit. So your dwelling units are going to have a limitation on their height based on the base zone. So this could be 30 feet, for example, in the RS17 zone. But the other thing that's important to understand is these zones also have an angled plane restriction. So what this means is at the side yard setback, we can only go up 24 feet and then we have an angled plane restriction and we have to keep the structure within that angled plane. So this really encourages you to build a structure which has a pitched roof so it stays within that angled plane. However, when the building department was creating these new regulations, they saw the angled plane as a setback and the ADUs and the JADUs do not have to respect the angled plane. What this means is in a lot of scenarios, your accessory dwelling unit can be taller closer to the side yard setback than your dwelling unit can be. So this is a huge advantage. The guest quarters are gonna have the same angle plane restriction that the dwelling units have. Okay, and here's just the last thing to consider here. The dwelling unit has to be constructed before anything else is built. So you can do these simultaneously. You can do a dwelling unit and an ADU on the same permit but you can't do an ADU or a JADU ADU or a guest quarters until you first have that initial dwelling unit built. Now, the ADU can be attached or detached, but the JADU has to be attached. Now, it can be attached to the dwelling unit proper, or it could be attached to the accessory dwelling unit. That's a new regulation that was implemented into that code, um, I believe around November of 2020. Uh, finally, the guest quarters, that can be attached or detached. And just one more thing I should note here. There is some little quirks with this JADU typology. So the JADU can share a bathroom with the unit that it's attached to. There's very limited circumstances when you would want to do this because, of course, you're going to have some overlapping of the tenants, which could create issues. But in certain cases, it could be a strategy to add more square footage to your lot. And depending on the way you design the JADU, this could come in handy in a lot of scenarios. Um, 
And finally, the JADU does require owner occupancy on the premises. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, now I wanna talk about the fees that you're gonna pay as you go through this process. So we have the same columns from the left to the right, dwelling unit, accessory dwelling unit, junior accessory dwelling unit, and guest quarters here. And generally, each of these are going to pay four types of fees. So I wanna just go through all four and explain which would be exempt from which fees. So first you have your plan check and inspection fees. Now these are gonna be consistent across all four typologies. They're all gonna to have to pay this. So the plan check fee is what you pay when you make your initial permit submittal and the city will send you an invoice and you're gonna pay based on the square footage of the unit you're proposing to permit. And then once the permit is issued, they're gonna charge you your inspection fees and you're gonna pay this invoice, the permit's gonna become valid and that's gonna cover your inspections in your building phase, in your construction phase. So th this is all the same for all four of these typologies. Now school fees are charged by the San Diego Unified School District and they charge you $4.08 per square foot. However, there are certain ways you can avoid these fees. So if you're doing an addition to your dwelling unit, 500 square feet or less, you're exempt from these school fees. For your ADU, if your ADU is 500 square foot or less, you're also exempt from school fees. The JADU is always 500 square feet or less, so it's naturally exempt. And the guest quarters uh, haven't permitted one of these in a while, but I think it's the same thing. Basically, if you're under 500 square feet, you would be exempt. Next up is the sewer and water fees. And these are the fees they don't talk about when the Development Services Department is marketing how um, cost-effective these ADUs are to build. They're never really talking about these additional hidden fees, but you will be subject to these fees, so it's very important you understand this upfront in the ADU design process. So your sewer and water fees are generally $7,200 per unit. So anytime you're gonna build a new home in San Diego, you're gonna be subject to these sewer and water fees and they're gonna charge you $7,200. If you were to do an addition to an existing home, you would be exempt from them because you're not adding a new dwelling. However, the ADUs and the JADUs are currently charged only 50% of the sewer and water fees. So you're only gonna pay $3,600 and you're basically gonna have a cost save of $3,600 in comparison to the dwelling units. Now the fourth and, um, we'll call it the fourth and last major fee that you're gonna pay through this permit process is gonna be your impact fees. And the impact fees vary from community to community. And if you Google San Diego impact fee schedule, you can see what the impact fees for your community are. Impact fees are frustrating because the impact fees cover the exact same things that your property taxes are already paying for. So it is you are getting double charged for these. Dwelling units are subject to these impact fees. So if you, if you were to put up another home, a brand new home, in the mid-city area, which is where El Cerrito is, you're going to pay just about $13,400 as a one-time fee in impact fees for that new home. However, for ADUs and JADUs, these fees are currently waived, and this may not last forever, but as I'm recording this video in May of 2021, impact fees are waived for ADUs and JADU typologies. So if you add up the savings on the sewer and water fees and the impact fees, your ADUs and JADUs are gonna be roughly $17,000 less in fees in comparison to the dwelling units. So in almost all cases, you want to build these ADUs before you build your dwelling units. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, you do have to have at least one dwelling unit on the lot before you qualify for these. Okay, let's move on to part three. So this is ADU regulations and codes. And I'm just gonna keep this kind of surface level because it does get really deep and the municipal code has a ton of gray area, which is um, difficult to sort through but I think I'm gonna just try to keep this on a surface level and explain all of these to you very simply. So let's take a look again at the RS zones and the RM zones, and let's look at them in terms of maximum development opportunity. 
So in the RS zone, if you had a vacant lot, you could basically design the lot so you could build one dwelling unit, one junior accessory dwelling unit, one guest quarters, and one accessory dwelling unit. And you can put all these on the same lot. So that means you can rent this out as three different units on an RS zoned lot. Now in the RM zoned lot, we can do multiple dwelling units plus one guest quarters plus at least two accessory dwelling units. So there's more opportunity in the RM zones and I just wanna go into that a little bit deeper here and explain why there's so much more opportunity. So this only applies, this slide here only applies to the RM zones. So if we were to build an initial dwelling unit, we can then build a second and third accessory dwelling unit. Now, once we have these built, if we also happen to be in the transit priority area, and this only applies if we're in the transit priority area, which you can see on this map on the left over here, we would also be able to build two more ADUs. The third ADU would be considered a deed restricted affordable unit, which would be rentable, rented at an affordable housing rate for 15 years. And you would sign a contract with the city to confirm that you're gonna rent it at this rate for 15 years. And if we do that, then our fourth ADU is a bonus ADU. It does not have to be deed restricted. And we could essentially continue this process until we fill up the entire lot or max out the FAR. So in some cases, you may be able to fit eight units on, on an RM lot with a 3,500 square foot uh, site area. So that's pretty interesting. A couple other things that always come up when we talk about accessory dwelling units. So ADUs and JADUs do not require parking anymore. And then additionally, there's some other things that if we build the ADU, it modifies our parking conditions. So if we build an ADU, then we're now allowed to park in our front yard setback. This is something that's not enforced, so it doesn't come up very frequently, but if you're going to get a permit and you show parking in your front yard, in the front yard setback, which is generally the first 15 or 20 feet of that front yard area, if you don't have the accessory dwelling unit, you're not allowed to park there. In fact, you can get a ticket for parking there. However, once we build this ADU, we can now park in that front yard setback. So that opens up more parking opportunity for our development. Um, additionally, some, some lots in San Diego are not allowed to have tandem parking. This is another thing that's not enforced in reality, but when you go to apply for your permit, if you show tandem parking and you're not in the tandem parking zone, your project can get rejected. However, once we build this ADU, we're now allowed to use tandem parking any way we see fit. So the ADU or the JADU open up the parking regulations a little bit. An ADU can push past the maximum FAR by 800 square feet. So I explained FAR a little earlier in the video. If for some reason we're all maxed out on our floor area ratio and we're not allowed to build any new square footage outside of the existing building envelope, that doesn't prevent us from building an ADU because we're allowed to go an extra 800 square foot for one ADU. So that means in almost all cases, we can fit an ADU up to about 800 square feet on these RS or RM zone lots. This one comes up a lot, it's a common misconception. The ADU is actually allowed to be larger than your dwelling unit. So there could be certain scenarios where you would have a much smaller dwelling unit and a much larger 1,200 square feet or so accessory dwelling unit. So the junior ADU does require the owner to live on the property. And I'm not quite sure why the city is requiring this because this is not something that is gonna help our housing crisis. I think it's something that they've put in here to, to try to restrict um, illegal renting of JADUs. And of course, with the new 2019 building code, solar panels will be required on your new ADU or um, any new dwelling unit for that matter. Now let's just talk about some costs here and these are just some general costs. An architect for an ADU is gonna cost you around $10,000 to $20,000. Uh, right here at 1070 Architecture, and midway through 2021, 
Our current rates are around twelve to fifteen thousand dollars for smaller ADUs and fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for our larger ADUs. A structural engineer is going to cost around twenty five hundred to seventy five hundred dollars. Now, generally, you have to get the design complete before you can send it to the structural engineer, so you're not going to see your structural engineering rate up front. Um, the easier it is to build, the less expensive that structural engineering will cost. If you design something with a whole bunch of cantilevers, a whole bunch of glass, not a lot of shear walls, this is going to be on the higher end of the structural engineering spectrum. Um, a lot of people refer to the Title 24 report, but it's more properly called an energy compliance report. And these are running around $300, $400 to $500 right now. So most ADUs are going to cost about $10,000 in permits and other fees, as we discussed. Those are, uh, these are all soft costs. And construction costs start around $225 a square foot uh, midway through this pandemic in 2021. Um, the projects that we take on in the office here at 1070 Architecture, we require our clients to have a minimum budget of $250 a square foot um, before we take on the project. At $225 a square foot, basically you are not making any decisions for your project. Your budget is making the decisions for you and you don't get to pick any finishes that are above the entry price point level finish. And that's how you get that $225 a square foot budget but it is very, very challenging to hit that budget. So really $250 a square foot is much more practical. Okay, despite what San Diego's Development Services Department tells you, the permit process has only gotten more difficult. When the city switched over to their digital process here, uh, they were raving about how convenient this was gonna be, but in our experience, it's literally been anything but convenient. The only benefit to you is that you do not have the expense of printing anymore. Um, it still is taking uh, about four months, four plus months to pull a permit for a simple project here in San Diego. So sometimes we have clients come to us and say they have a very easy project. There is no such thing as an easy project in San Diego, especially when you're getting a permit for these projects. The Development Services Department um, has employees that range from incredibly good to unbelievably poor. And through this process, you're randomly gonna get paired up with somebody and this is going to impact the amount of time and stress that you go through getting this permit. The state has required that the city issue you reviews within 60 days for ADUs and JADUs. This is in the state uh, ADU regulations. And in our experience, the city of San Diego is not respecting this and we've tried to address this with them and they have said that 60 days is not a reasonable time frame for them to return comments back. So this is very unfortunate for our citizens and for our housing crisis. Um, but the city of San Diego is not completely in alignment with the uh, required state ADU regulations. Um, finally, infill projects and projects within the federally designated promise zone are supposed to receive expedite plan review. So they're calling this rapid review. If you have a project which is infill, which means there's already a development on the lot, like a house, for example, or you're in the promise zone and you can Google San Diego promise zone to see if you are, then you should get a rapid review project, a rapid review permit. So you have to request this because most times the city reviewers are not going to um, put, put you in this category unless you push for it. So that's certainly something that you should check. So general timelines, it does take about one to two months to design these types of projects working with our clients. And we usually have about five to six meetings with the clients and we go sort of step by step through the design phase with them until they get the project that is exactly what they're looking for. Once the project is completed being designed, we will send it out to the structural engineer. And from this point on, you really want very limited changes because it will complicate things greatly if you have changes after you complete the design during uh, engineering. So it'll take about one month to engineer the drawings and we get the, the energy compliance report completed in this period as well. Then we're gonna send it off to permitting. It used to take us two to three months to permit these projects, but these days it's taking us over four months. In fact, the city is not even um, assigning the projects to the reviewers in a lot of cases for a full two month 
So um, it is taking very, very long to permit right now in San Diego. And then you can expect construction to last about six months to 12 months, depending on um, how diligent your general contractor is, how available your subcontractors are, and also the availability of the materials that you want to install because um, with the pandemic we're experiencing right now, there is a material shortage. Okay, and the fourth part of this presentation, and maybe the most exciting part, is all about the loopholes and the cost-saving tips which we've discovered while we work through designing and permitting these ADUs for our clients. So the first one is the garage conversion into an ADU loophole. So conversions of unhabitable space, which would include like garages, mechanical rooms, storage rooms, maybe a laundry room, that type of thing. If we're converting those spaces into an ADU, then you're exempt from sewer and water fees and school fees. So this is gonna save you about $5,000 in those permit fees. You can even add up to 150 square feet to that unhabitable space, but you can't add more than 150 square feet. So that's very important. Um, and then finally, these projects, these types of conversions into ADUs are not required to install solar panels. And solar panels can get very expensive. It can be a $10,000 cost. So to avoid something like that on a project with a lower budget is really an ideal. So this is a tip that will save you $5,000 if you can make it happen. This is another important cost saving tip. So if you have an existing home, an existing primary dwelling unit on your lot and you wanna build an ADU, that ADU will not be subject to fire sprinklers if the existing dwelling unit does not have fire sprinklers. So this is another cost save. If you choose to not install fire sprinklers, you have that option. If you have two dwelling units and one of them has fire sprinklers, your ADU or junior ADU will be required to have fire sprinklers. Okay, this is maybe the most important one. Most existing water meters are three quarters of an inch. And with that three quarter of an inch water meter, you can accommodate three to four total units before you have to upgrade your water meter. If you have to upgrade your water meter, you're gonna be upgrading it to a one inch water meter, and that's gonna cost you about $10,000. The reason it costs so much is because the water meter is located in the right of way. So you have to get a right of way permit and there's an expense for the permit and the expense to process that permit. And then you have to hire a class A license to do the work in the right of way. And that's another expense because sometimes your general contractor will only have a class B license and he's not eligible to do this work. Now, the way you avoid this fee, the way you can check these things as you're going through the design process is you wanna Google something called uh, you want to Google San Diego water meter data card and you can go through the chart and you can fill this out and you can make sure that you're under 40 fixture units and if you're under 40 fixture units you can keep that three quarter inch water meter if you're over 40 they're gonna make you upgrade the meter so certain tricks that you can use to stay under that three quarter inch meter would be to eliminate your hose bibs along the outside of the house um, abstain from installing dishwashers and washer and dryers, and um, also things like a bathtub take up quite a bit of um, fixture units on that, on that uh, chart. So you wanna be really cautious about adding new water fixtures. ADUs and JADUs are exempt from capital improvements based on valuation. So when you get your invoice from the city of San Diego, you're gonna to wanna to review that invoice, and more often than not, we find that the city is using the cost of our ADUs and JADUs to increase their valuation of our project. And sometimes this can trigger a sidewalk upgrade or a driveway curb cut upgrade. So you probably weren't planning on doing that work when you started the project. So you don't wanna to pay to do this work now, but the trick here is that ADUs and JADUs are exempt from this valuation. So if once you go over $100,000 in valuation, it's gonna trigger these upgrades, these right of way upgrades. You have to make sure that the building department is not valuating your ADU and JADU to trigger this. Um, otherwise you're gonna end up with all these additional fees and additional work. So that's one that you have to be very diligent about reviewing city invoices. Okay, this one gets a little technical, so stay with me here. 
if you have a duplex, which is two attached units, this is considered an R3 occupancy classification. Okay, so a duplex or, or one unit, those fall under the R3 occupancy classification. Now, if you have a triplex or more, that's gonna be considered an R2 occupancy classification. And that's gonna trigger the need for a mechanical and electrical engineering plan check. Now, if you're gonna design an R2 structure, you may have to hire the mechanical and electrical engineers to provide the work to satisfy the plan checker. So there's an additional cost that's gonna come from that. However, if you have a duplex with an attached garage, you can convert that garage to an ADU, and this is not gonna trigger a fire sprinkler upgrade. So, and don't let them tell you it does because we've gone down this road and they have tried to say that we have to install fire sprinklers throughout the entire building. But if you are converting an existing garage, even if it's in a duplex and now you're gonna have a triplex, the garage use is more hazardous than the dwelling unit use, so it does not trigger fire sprinklers. So just make sure that you don't get that comment back through your plan check process. And then just as a general um, idea, anytime you're gonna be two units or less, that's gonna give you an easier plan check because you're gonna be in the R3 occupancy classification. Okay, and this is the last thing I wanna to talk to you about today. So we have designed a pre-designed accessory dwelling unit. Um, this is the one that we're currently building ourselves. It's a self-funded ADU. It's 525 total square feet, one bedroom, one bath, two stories. This unit will fit on lots 25 feet wide or less, uh, excuse me, 25 feet wide or larger. So you can build this on a 25 foot wide lot or a 50 foot wide lot. Using a pre-designed ADU is gonna reduce design, engineering, permitting, cost, and time. So there's considerable cost and time savings by using this design. Also, this has been designed so it's easy to build for a contractor. And the starting construction cost is gonna be around $125,000. $125, um, and also the roof is oriented for solar panels. On the left, you have the first floor plan and on the right, you have the second floor plan. So on the first floor plan, we have the bedroom and bathroom. So in the middle of the night, you don't have to go up or down a flight of stairs. So those are on the same floor. And on the second floor, we have all of our living spaces, our kitchen, dining room, living room, small pantry, and some storage above the refrigerator. This is how it would look from the outside. This is the first floor layout here, so you can see how the closet works with the bedroom and then the patio, which is adjacent to the bedroom. You can see the bathroom on the lower right side and on the top right, you can see the entryway and then how you could go up the stairs to the second floor. Here's the second floor. So you can see one potential furniture layout here. Kitchen's on the right side, living room's on the left side. We have that pantry on the top right over here. And then just some general renders here. So this is the bedroom with an optional wet bar. This is the second floor and you can see that vaulted ceiling. So uh, one of the things we do a lot here at 1070 Architecture is we design taller than eight foot ceilings. Uh, there's a lot of value in ceiling height and you see that consistent across a lot of our designs. This is another rendering of that second floor looking from the kitchen back towards the living room. And that concludes this presentation, the truth about accessory dwelling units, what they won't tell you at the development services department. So if you have any questions about this, you can go to the website, you can go to 1070architecture.com and there's a section where you can send us questions about an ADU you're considering building. And we go through those, we go through our emails basically every day and uh, we'll do our best to answer these and get back to you. So if you have any questions, 1070architecture.com and if you wanna follow us on Instagram, you can go to 1070 architecture or you can go to at 1070 architecture to check us out on Instagram. Okay. Thanks for your time.